it is a stalker story, but it's a stalker story with a twist. It's a stalker story done differently. Every now and again, I have these sort of giddy bursts of excitement where I'm almost like a kid back at school. And then I have these bouts of, oh my God, everyone's gonna know my shit. Oh my God, everyone's gonna know what happened to me. All right, fuck it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> 41,071 emails, 350 hours of voicemail, 744 tweets, 46 Facebook messages, four fake Facebook accounts, 106 pages of letters, and one cup of tea. Yeah, you know, it's funny, I sometimes find the baby reindeer plot quite hard to describe, which kind of speaks to its strengths in a way. It's a true story. <laughs> Based in my early 20s, where I went through quite a lot of pretty crazy things. <laughs> baby reindeer follows the story of a man who gives a woman a cup of tea on the house, a kind gesture to cheer her up, and then the negative fallout of that kind gesture a sort of a gesture that goes on to create the, uh, extreme negative ramifications in his life and how ultimately his warped relationship with that woman Martha goes on to force him to confront other things in his life If you leave my family alone I will hang your curtains tonight Essentially it is a stalker story but it's a stalker story with a twist it's a, it's a stalker story done differently I had a friend who used to live here once. It shows, in my opinion, the messy side of stalking. The side of stalking which isn't necessarily black and white. You can't call me a stalker! Well, you're the one creeping around my house at night, peering in through my windows, sending me emails, begging for my bum hole! I'm aware that Baby Reindeer touches on themes that are quite current and quite present in society, but I, I like to think it doesn't form an opinion or, or ram a certain sense of morals down, down people's throat. Ultimately, yeah, it is just an autobiographical story that I, I felt the need to tell. The story of a, a, a messed up period of time in my life. You're strange. Am I? Shit. Don't worry. I don't mind a bit of strange. Yeah, the stand-up in the early years was terrible. You're shite! I think what I was trying to do was, was do a weird brand of comedy, a sort of anti-comedy, like a subversive style, to audiences that just weren't interested in that. They just wanted to hear some jokes. So my mum died today. I alienated people en masse. Really? When the real-life Martha turned up, who thought I was hilarious, she might have been the only one on the planet that found me hilarious, so it was galvanizing. I loved that. I loved somebody laughing at all my jokes. <laughs> Baby Reindeer actually started out as a one-man show. I took it to the Edinburgh Festival, and it was kind of a first-hand account of everything that kind of happens in Baby Reindeer. It transferred to London, and it was a massive hit. And it was at that point that Netflix came to me and were like, have you, have you thought about putting this in a series? And I was like, yes, I have. <laughs> And it was a hell of a journey transforming a one-man stage show to big old productions, seven episodes, multiple characters. It was a huge undertaking. I really wanted the humour to, to provide sort of release during the series. You know, with a show like this that goes to the territory it goes to, I, I just knew that without laughter along the way, it could have been a very, <laughs> very dark experience indeed, yeah. You say this woman is stalking you? Yeah, she comes to my work, she comes to my house. She sends me emails, like, 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 all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say that's particularly threatening. <laughs> so during Baby Reindeer, there's, there's the flashback episode where we actually go back in time to Donnie going to the Edinburgh Fringe, meeting someone in the industry who, who takes them under their, their wing, helps them uh, in their career, but, but goes on to abuse Donnie. 
Fucking hell, that's disgusting. Little pain for a little game. And that's obviously taken from my real life experiences. And it, yeah, it was a hell of a thing to, to write and shoot. And uh, it kind of shows a side of a, abuse that I don't think we've seen before. I still think there's a, an idea that sexual abuse is a kind of a pill in a drink that dissolves and someone wakes up and they don't know where they are. And, and that does happen and that is a big problem. But a lot of abuse occurs in very intimate relationships. I think I wanted to show just how complicated and psychologically messed up situations can get to. And so I hope that when people see it, who have been through similar things, that they feel less shame around it, that they, 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 they feel maybe emboldened to take it on in their life and, and deal with it in a way where they don't see it as a, a dent to their character in some way. I hope it provides peace I think it would have provided peace for me. I was going through like a masculinity crisis. I had all these kind of like broken ideas of what it meant to be a man, and this doesn't happen to a man. Oh, fuck! I just didn't know who I was anymore. I, I felt disconnected from everyone. I was in, working in a very sort of heteronormative bar. When are you two gonna shag? Ah, uh, don't believe in sex before marriage. I felt like I didn't belong, and then there was someone there filling me up with all of these kinds of the I, who I wanted to be. They saw me the way I wanted to be. You've got really manly hands, haven't you? Oh yeah. Big deep voice, chiselled jawline. Should be illegal to have your bone structure too, you know. They should tax you for it, man tax. <laughs> Having someone at the end of the bar who was pure, unadulterated adoration is kind of what I needed. But but it was foolish of me, and it was it was using someone. And, and it, I guess I was punished for that in quite, a, quite an extreme way. Jesus Christ, Mother, how long have you been sitting out here for? Things got pretty out of control. I was going through so many different crises at once. I was sort of trying to come to terms with the past. I was trying to come to terms with the present and figure out how to, to solve this situation with Martha. I was also having a relationship on the sly and, and trying to keep it under wraps because I felt a, a degree of shame around it, which I should never have felt. And I think my whole life existed in a prism of denial and shame and lying. When you're not living truthfully and when you're not speaking the truth to people and you're not being honorable to those around you and you're not being honorable to yourself nothing but destruction waits for you some people run away by packing their bags others run away by standing in the same place for too long i was very keen for martha to be layered sorry Woke up a little gravy this morning. To show the side of stalking that it is a mental illness and show the fact that there was someone there who was doing a bad thing, who wasn't necessarily a bad person. Make me smile. That just had a lot of trauma in their life that they were going through and no one brought that to the screen like Jess. When I was on stage, I would sort of play Martha. I would sort of be like, can I offer you a cup of tea? No, thanks. But then to see Martha come alive, like through Jess's performance, it was, it was something to behold. There were times on set where I was acting with her, I'd almost forget to say my line back because I was too busy going, fucking hell, she's good. Oh no. Oh no, please. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, please. Holy shit. I almost couldn't believe how much she was channeling the real life person. What the hell? Warm welcome. Terry's like the voice of reason. The real life person used to always call me out on my shit. And I always used to find it confronting. My behavior was so irrational. And so it was very important to have Terry be the voice of reason in the show. That's like the craziest shit I've ever heard. I mean, she was the voice of reason in my life at that point as well. Not that I listened to her as much as I should have. My parents haven't seen this show already and I've warned them against certain episodes. My mum will phone up on behalf of my dad and be like, so what's he like in the show? I think he said, fucking come back from what have you? No, it's not, no. It's... It was very important to get my parents, yeah, yeah. what they've done for me, kind of in there. 
I think the things I've been through are pretty, you know, they take their toll on parents. And my biggest regret is putting them through some of the things that I put them through. I couldn't help it, but I feel bad about that, you know. Um, but I had nowhere else to turn. I needed my mum and my dad. Um, but they've been, yeah, they've been very, um, yeah, they've been very uh, special. Um, and they've been there for me. But I really regret the, the, the worry I've caused them, which still continues to this day, I think. I think there's a lot of people who are going to want to drill into the debate around the show, the morality of the show itself. My ultimate hope is that it moves people and that it touches people and it affects people. Oh, this fucking world. All it does is take from you. I want people to feel a sense of peace around it and people who've been through similar things to feel a great sense of comfort in it. I ultimately want it to stand on its own two feet as a really good piece of art and a good television show. That's what I hope. I can't control how this is going to be received. And I can't control how people are going to see me as a result of this show. And that's kind of uncomfortable. My main hope is that people see the place where it came from. It's born out of true events. It's born out of a real life happening. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's just someone telling a story about their life.